In this video, I'll describe a more realistic distribution of dopant densities around a junction because no junction is truly abrupt. We will develop a linearly graded model of the dopant concentration profile in the vicinity of a junction. The expression for built-in potential is drastically affected by the profile of the dopants in the semiconductor. It's nice to kind of assume that the dopant density is uniform throughout the end side. It's all donors at the same density all the way up to the junction. And then on the P side, it's all acceptors at the same density. But it just doesn't work out that way. That is an idealized doping profile. Let me just draw a picture with an abrupt doping profile. I put it in quotes because it doesn't exist. Nearly realized by certain methods, such as if the junction is made by epitaxial growth, that is where one atomic layer at a time is grown, perhaps the P-type on the bottom and then the N-type on the top, then it's, it's possible to have a, a pretty close to abrupt junction. And other more careful shallow low temperature diffusion can give you a pretty uh, tight junction. For the most part, there's always some sort of profile of the dopants. And there's a more realistic model, which is linear profile. So that would be the linearly graded junction, which we're going to talk about. In this case, you have a more gradual drop-off. What's graphed here on the vertical axis is the difference between the dopant density and the acceptor density. Go back up to the abrupt junction and see how that makes sense. On the left side, it's all donors. And on the right side, it's all acceptors at their respective levels. On the left side, the number of donors minus the number of acceptors is the number density of acceptors. And on the right side, the number of donors minus the number of acceptors is minus the number density of the acceptors. And so that's why it goes negative on the right side. This is a key thing. I call it the net dopant density. I just made that term up myself. But it's a, the difference between the donor density and the acceptor density anywhere in the semiconductor. And in the case of a linearly graded junction, that means that a net dopant density is a straight line. And so it's drawn that way, straight. At some point here, the number of donors and acceptors is equal. And to the left, there are more donors, and you're in the n-type. To the right, there are more acceptors, and you're in the p-type. But the drop-off is gradual. The change is gradual. So you're gradually losing donors to the right. You're gradually losing acceptors to the left, until finally you get so deep in the semiconductor it might level off. At this point here, there is a zero charge density. So that's the linear doping profile. The linear graded junction is a more realistic picture than the abrupt junction, and an exponentially graded junction is a more realistic picture than a linear junction because of the way diffusion works. So it's an erroneous process of moving the, the dopants through the material. But we're going to describe the linearly graded junction today. So let's take a close-up then of the graph. Horizontally, it's just going across the, the semiconductor. And the whole picture here is the junction. That, that's what I, I mean to show you here is the, uh, the junction region. The junction is, is the line here, but the, the region around it is the junction region. Vertically is graphed that net dopant density, number of donors minus the number of acceptors, and we're just going to call it N for uh, some mathematical purposes. Uh, so at the point where the number of donors and the number of acceptors is equal, it's called the metallurgical junction. It's metallurgical not because the semiconducting material is a metal, it isn't, but because it's this is a result of diffusion. And you see the word, the term metallurgical junction, it is referring to the point between where your net donor and net acceptor. Because honestly, think about it. how do you define where the junction is? You, as say, as the, the material fabricator, tried your best to define it, but you know what? It doesn't matter where you think it is. What, what matters is where the metallurgical junction is. That's where we will call it. I uh, Notice I put this ghosted Q right there. That's 1.6 times 7 minus 19 coulombs. If ND minus NA is the net number of dopants, the number of donors minus the number of acceptors, Q times that is the actual charge due to dopant ions. Donors are positive and acceptors are negative as ions. And so if you just take that number difference and a you know, number per cubic centimeter difference and multiply it by Q, you have the charge per cubic centimeter 
due to ions. It says nothing about the free electrons and holes. And so this graph can serve a dual purpose uh, either way. And the slope, okay, back, back to just, just think of it as, as the net dopant density. The slope is dn by dx will abbreviate as a, just for you know, purposes of simplicity, y equals mx plus b, and the slope is zero at the origins. The net dopant density anywhere along here is simply the slope times x, so a times x. Really useful. We're going to use that expression later, too. So let's talk about charge, because I ghosted out this Q. I, I put this ghost Q in here. So that means charge is an important thing to talk about. The charge due to ions just keeps going up and up and up and up, up or down and down and down and down. But the net charge is what we have in this, this little bow tie looking graph here. Um, and so rho is the net charge. It's due to both the ions and the carriers. Because at some point, you get far enough away from the metallurgical junction that you're out of any depletion region out here in the hinterlands. You can have electrons or holes. In the region around the actual junction, you have depletion where carriers leave. And so all of the space charge is due entirely to ions, and so it's not zero. So this is the positive space charge region. That's the negative space charge region. And literally from one side of the bow tie to the other is the depletion region. So you want to know what the depletion length is. You figure out what this point is, and you figure out what that point is, and the distance between them is the depletion width. And we're about to figure out what, what that really is. You might call these points x sub n and x sub p because that's what we have called those points where on the n side the depletion region ends and on the p side the, the depletion region ends. But I would point out that they have to be equal if you have linearly graded doping. They're going to have to be equal uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're measured from the metallurgical junction. Because it's a very ambiguous definition now of where is the junction, and we just say it's where the net dopant density is zero. If you measure out from there, you will measure the same values of x sub n and x sub p. The physics forces that to be the case because you do need to have charge neutrality throughout the semiconductor. Beyond the depletion region, the semiconductor is charge neutral which means that whatever net charge you have in this positive space charge region has to be equal to the net charge in the negative space charge region. Since they're both given by the same line here, you have to have equal x sub n and x sub p in order to have the same amount of charge on the left side as you do on the right side. So this positive space charge region has to be equal and opposite to the negative. And so we'll just call it W is the depletion width. From the X sub N to the X sub P, we're going to call that W. And each one of these X's then is W over 2. We'll keep that in mind for a minute. Let's do some math. We're going to use Gauss's law in differential form. You may or may not have seen this before. Gauss's law in integral form it says that if you take the normal component of an electric field, integrate it over an area, so that's the electric flux, so you just sum up the product of electric field, normal component, uh, times the area. You sum that up, you get the enclosed charge, right? Enclosed charge. That says ENCL over the permittivity of the medium, uh, which in this case is that semiconductor. If you do some vector math on this, you come up with an equivalent statement, and I'm just going to uh, put this in, in English for you. The equivalent statement says that if you are inside of a charge density, rho, coulombs per cubic meter, and you're somewhere in, inside that charge distribution, then that charge density divided by the permittivity is the divergence of the electric field. It's del dot E. That's an equivalent statement that you can prove with vector calculus. We're going to take it and run with it. I drew this out as a one-dimensional problem. And, you know, it's a one-dimensional problem in CMOS, right? Because your films are so thin. Well, it's a two-dimensional problem, but we, we treat it as one-dimensional problem. That's one of the nice things about CMOS is we can preserve that low dimensionality. So in one dimension, you know, there's no difference between gradient and divergence. In one dimension, uh, we just write that at L dot E as DE by DX. Here's an expression. This is Gauss's law in one dimension. If you replace electric field with 
minus the gradient of potential, you have a second derivative that is technically referred to as Poisson's equation. We can get from our graph here an expression for the charge density. We have this straight line. If I consider the vertical axis to be charge, then it's charge times the net charge density is the density at any given point along here. So at any given point along this junction, we'll say that the net charge density is Q times the net dopant density, as long as you're in the depletion region. So we're not befuddling things with uh, carriers. Of course, you get outside the depletion region, the net charge goes to zero uh, because the carriers are present now. So that's rho, and it only has value inside the depletion region from minus W over 2 to plus W over 2. Rho has value. We'll replace the nd minus na with a, and so we're not doing awkward derivations. What is n? n is the slope times x, and the slope, I'm going to just write it out explicitly. Instead of a, I'll write dn by dx, but yeah, it's a. So the charge density is q times ax, anywhere along here. I could have just said that because I already made the case that n is ax. So this is the net charge per volume. Okay, so put this rho expression, qax, put it in Gauss's law, and we have this expression we're going to work with. Now that you know how to solve. So now we have an equation we can work with. So that's the gradient of the electric field in a junction in one dimension. So to solve it, first of all, I'll take the dx and put it on the other side. So just move it on over and there we go, integrate. So I brought the dx over and instead of de, you know, integral of de is just e. So e is q a over e epsilon sub s times that integral. Solve it. So if you integrate from the left edge of the junction to where you're interested in this, so x is your point of interest. I want to know e at that point. Start at the left edge of the junction and just integrate and uh, that gives you the electric field and we have this expression now i haven't explicitly said that when x equals minus w over 2 the electric field is zero but you can look at the result you got and surmise that on your own when x is w over 2 yes the electric field is zero there's our expression for the electric field inside the depletion region Another point then, yeah, when x equals zero, we know what the maximum E field is, just in case you want to know how high the E field ever gets. Where is the E field a maximum? The E versus position is actually this dome-shaped thing, parabola. It's maximum right at the metallurgical junction. Set x equals zero, and what's left is the expression for it. So we have an expression for the electric field inside of the semiconductor as you pass from the one side of the junction to the other. So we can find the voltage drop across the semiconductor. That is the built-in potential. So let's find the built-in potential by finding the voltage drop that corresponds to this expression for electric field. Remember, if you integrate electric field, uh, you get potential difference. Electric field is minus d potential by d x, right? It's minus the gradient of potential. Then the voltage drop, the difference in potential is, and this is just sophomore definition here, right, is minus the integral from one edge of the junction to the other. I could say from minus infinity to plus infinity since there is no electric field beyond the depletion region, but I'll just integrate from one edge of the depletion region to the other and solve that integral. I put in our expression for electric field, so I'll solve the integral, and you have an expression that you can work with for the built in potential. Evaluate the integral at the limits, simplify, and you have that expression. Pause the video for a minute and follow through that solution. Make sure that you get to this on your own, that the built-in potential goes as the depletion width cubed. And that's a good thing to remember. Built-in potential goes as the depletion width cubed, or likewise, the depletion width goes as the cubed root of the built-in potential. Just re rearrange that. I point it out that way because in your textbook, the abrupt junction is treated. And so that's what you're reading, and this is what you're watching, the linear junction. And so you can compare this to the abrupt junction where the depletion width is proportional to the square root of the built-in potential. Last time, we derived an expression for built-in potential in terms of the doping densities. You know, that's still 
valid. <laughs> so, so you can get you know the built-in potential that way. There's a little ambiguity now in this linearly graded junction. What do you use for the doping densities? Well, what you use is the value of the doping densities at the edge of the depletion region. And that wasn't really explicitly stated in the derivation of this expression. N sub D and N sub A were, were considered constants, uniform throughout the, the region. So there wasn't a, an issue. But yes, N sub D and N sub A are the net doping density at the edge of the depletion region. That's what you should be using here. N is A times W over 2. So use that for each of these. So, so put a w over 2n for the n sub d, put a w over 2n for n sub a. Simplify things down. I think you should pause the video and make sure you can put this in for each of these and simplify it to this red box. And that is the built-in potential in the case of a linearly graded junction in terms of the depletion width. And you might say, well, that's not very practical, except you also have an expression for the depletion width that you can use. The expressions in these three boxes can go together to give you uh, problem-solving power. These are built-in potentials for gallium arsenide and silicon calculated with that expression as a function of the value of the doping profile A. You have a homework problem that you're going to work on. I'll give you a minute to read this. Okay, you have the three expressions in that box, now, so you can just you know write this out. But you look at this and you say, whoa, I, I'm not sure how to solve this. I'm given A, and I want to uh, know what the built-in potential. Well, okay, you put that value in there for A. Oh, but I need no W. Well, that's okay. I go back here. I can solve this for W. I realize I have myself a transcendental equation. You have to solve this transcendental equation. All you're given is a value for A. Solve the transcendental equation. How do you solve a transcendental equation? You, you may have learned this in a mathematical physics course, but you solve it by iteration. The way I do it is, I, first of all, I make an educated guess. So make an educated guess for built-in potential. Uh, try different things. I, I'm just saying 0.5 volts. I challenge you to try something else like 0.6. So you put it in, you get W, and then you... Uh, Sub that result back in and then continue. You, you get a new value then for the built-in potential. You put it back in, get a new value for W, and just iteratively arrive. It'll converge. And where it converges is the answer. So do that. Do that for your homework. I'll stop with that for now.